Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask your blessing upon us as you move forward into this time of impartation where you can impart to us, speak to us, offer us your word of conviction and hope, deliverance and inspiration, encouragement as we open ourselves to you fully, mind, heart, body, and soul. Use us, Lord, so that you might get all the glory. I now decrease and ask that you would increase, that every word that is uttered, every revelation that is given, will give glory to you. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, and all God's people together said, Amen. Well, friends, if you have siblings, you have been a part of generational conflicts. It's not whose mom's favorite. Everybody knows it's the oldest. That's whose mom's favorite. The generational conflict that you've been a part of, if you've got siblings, no matter how old or how young they are, is who gets the bigger piece? Whether it's the bigger piece of cake, whether it's the bigger piece of pie, whether it's the bigger helping of peach cobbler, whether it's the bigger helping of whatever it is, bigger slice of pizza, whatever it is, if you've got a sibling, you've all wrestled with, why did he get or why did she get that piece? I wanted that piece. Why do they get more than I get? You don't like me. You don't love me as much as you love them. And if you don't remember saying that or hearing that, you are blessed and highly favored with wonderful siblings. Indeed, we believe that we deserve more for various reasons. I'm the oldest. I deserve more while I'm the most handsome. I deserve more while I'm the youngest. I'm the baby. I deserve more. Whatever the reason, we believe that there's a reason that we deserve more than anyone else. As people of faith, friends, this attitude continues even in our communities of faith, that we believe that we deserve more than someone else. We deserve more because we've been in the church longer. We deserve more because our family has been in the church for generations. We deserve more because we're giving more. We deserve more because we are more notably recognized outside of the church. We deserve more, more influence, more time, more attention, more, more, more. Which brings us to point number one, friends. We, like the disciples, sometimes believe our proximity to Christ should guarantee that Christ should favor us more than others. We, like the disciples, sometimes believe that our proximity to Christ should guarantee that Christ should favor us more than others. I was sitting at Jesus' right hand while I was sitting at Jesus' left hand while I was always there with him. I was one of the three that he called with him into the time of prayer. Well, I'm the one that holds the money. All of us believe we deserve more. It's a mark of spiritual maturity when we move from that sense of infantile, that sense of I need to have more because I'm closer to you, when we recognize that because God gives to someone else doesn't mean that God is taking away from me. God is infinite in God's resources, and so what God can give to you, God can give to someone else, and just because they get it first doesn't mean you're not going to get it. That's part of our issue when we argue with our siblings is that if you get the bigger piece of pizza, that means I don't get it. The great thing about God is God has got one of those wonderful Detroit-style pizzas where it's just four corners and it's about all the same size. Each of us get the exact same size. Each of us will have the same number of pepperoni. Each of us will have the same wonderful cheese pull. God makes it so that none of us should be envious of others and therefore turning what should be communal harmony into communal strife. In our text, we find Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven through this wonderful parable. Jesus always used these word stories, these picture stories. In this parable, he compares the kingdom of God like a landowner who goes out and decides, I need some people to work in my vineyard. So uh, he goes down uh, to the local unemployment office. He says, I I need about 14 workers. And 14 people say, all right, we're willing to work. However, it's hot today, no breeze, uh, and your field doesn't have any trees or anything else around it. So here's what we want for this day's work. We want this wage. And the owner says, okay, not a problem. 
So 14 folks get in the van and they go out into the field and they're starting to work. And then the, la- the owner of the vineyard says, you know what? Uh, I got more land and I got workers. I need to go get some more. So he, he goes back, finds people hanging around, says, hey, would you want to work? They said, sure. He says, all right, great. Uh, that vineyard down the world, yeah, just go there, see the foreman, he'll put you to work. Great. Goes back another time. Uh, are you willing to work? Sure. All right. See the vineyard foreman put to work. Another time he comes out at the end part of the day, says, I still got some stuff to wrap up and I'll need it wrapped up today. Goes back, says, all right, are you willing to work? I say, sure. It's about an hour. And we've all been in that space where it's an hour left in the work day. And your mind says, I know I've got two or three assignments that I could do. But it could probably wait till tomorrow. He says, no, no, no. We're willing to work. He says, great. Down the road, vineyard, see the foreman. Go to work. And so at some point, the landowner says, all right, the end of the day has come. It's time to tally up what is worth and time to hand out the wages. So when it comes time to pay the workers, the landowner gives them the same wage regardless of when they began their time of work which makes those who started at the beginning of the day unhappy. Listen to these words. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the land order, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Again, it was their estimation. If people came after us, they were going to get less because we worked more. We were here more. We, we were the first ones in. We have been a part of this community of faith since one of the foreign of cornerstones have been laid. We deserve more than anyone that comes after us. I imagine those who started in the early part of the day at some point during the heat of the day said to themselves, as we often do, we would love to have some help in this vineyard. And they started to see help, and they were happy to get the help until it came time for payday. They were happy to get the help, happy to have other hands, happy to have more folks working and doing the job. I've offered this quote to you. J. Paul Getty says, I would rather have 1% of 100 people's effort than 100% of my own. So they said, look, we got more people coming out so we can give less effort and we can still get the job done until it came to payday. Indeed. As it comes time for compensation and for them to receive their remuneration, the first get their pay last. Now, I don't know about you now now that we've got to direct deposit. uh, Some of us don't even see our paycheck. It just automatically appears in our bank account. We look at it to make sure that it's right. We might even look at the little slip that they give us to make sure that they're taking out the right taxes. But we often don't get the actual paper check that we used to get where we go to the bank and we go through, we go to payroll, we get the check, and we go through it to make sure that my overtime was on here, that we go through, we get my PTO was on here. Uh, We go through the check before we left because we knew as soon as we left the office, we couldn't complain about what we got. So they get their wages and they're seeing, all right, the first are waiting, and they see the last ones who come, all right, they're getting a daily wage. The ones who came after, before them, they're getting a daily wage. The ones who came before them, they're getting a daily wage. The ones before them, they got a daily wage. Now, what you would think they would be able to come to some reasonable discernment around is everyone who's come before us got the same thing. Whether they came the last hour or they came an hour after us. So it would stand to reason that everybody's going to get the same thing. But in their minds, they said to themselves, we deserve more. And so the landowner is certainly going to give us more than they gave everyone else. Indeed, the same assumption these early workers made, we see that in our lives and in the church today. Indeed, we find ourselves saying, you know, Lord, we deserve more. We, we believe that we've done here. We've laid the foundations. We've laid the pillars. We, we should have our opinions, our preferences prioritized over anything else. And God presses and challenges us, us to say, well, whose church is it? Yes, your family has been a part of the inception, but whose church is it? The landowner says to those who work, Isn't it my discernment? Isn't it up to me to decide to give to whom as I chose? 
And it brings us to point number two. God responds to us based on the way we approach our relationship with God. God responds to us based on the way that we approach our relationship with God. These folks who came at the beginning of the day, they heard the same invitation that everyone else did, but they did something different. Did you notice the difference? Did you notice how they responded differently than everyone else? I'm going to break it down for you. I understand. Uh, You probably don't remember the scripture. It was a long scripture for today. Uh, And so here's the difference in how they responded. The same landowner comes out, looks for workers, says, I need some folks to go work in my vineyard. And their response wasn't, great, where is it? Let's go. Their response was, it's hot. It's the early part of the day. There's no trees. So we're going to negotiate what we feel we deserve. Same invitation. Their response was different. They made the response transactional. You want us to work, but we don't trust you to give us what we should have. And so we're going to negotiate what we think we deserve. And so at the end of the day, they got exactly what they negotiated for. But they were upset because they thought they deserved more. But they didn't rely on the landowner to be generous. Everyone else who responds to the invitation of coming to invite, coming out to the vineyard to work said, great, show us where we are and we will trust you to pay us what is fair. We're not going to negotiate with you up front what we think we deserve. We're not going to negotiate with you up front of how much we're willing to do. You know those negotiations we have with God. Uh, Lord, I will do this if that means I get X, Y, or Z. It's the opposite of our desperation prayer, which is, Lord, if you get me out of this, I promise I won't ever do this again. This is when God offers you an invitation to do something you don't want to do. And so you negotiate with God and say, well, God, if I do this, will I get this? And God says, that's what you really want? Yeah, that's what I want. If I do this, then I want that. And God says, all right. And we miss What's important about the invitation? The invitation is coming from someone who's fair. The invitation is coming from someone who knows all about us. The invitation is coming from someone who knows exactly what we need and what's going to be a blessing to our lives. And if we trust based on the relationship we've coveted with God, that God is going to do for us more than we could ever imagine or think, then we don't negotiate with God what we will do and what we will get in order to say yes to serving. Jeremiah, when he was called as a prophet, said, Lord, I, I can't go. He says, why can't you go? Because I'm young and I don't speak well. Not a problem. I'm going to put something in your mouth, give you some words to speak. Uh, regardless of your age, I'm going to give you wisdom beyond your age. Well, uh, I still can't go uh, because the people that you want to send me to are mean. <sighs> I will give you the internal fortitude and faith and strength to be able to deal with the mean people who will say mean things to you because you are a little fragile. Okay, now I need you to go. And he says, well, I still can't go. Why? Because it's going to be hard. And God finally has to tell Jeremiah, I'm offering you an invitation to be a prophet to save people who are going astray. And all you can think of is how hard it's going to be All you can do is come up with excuse after excuse of why you can't, as opposed to saying, yes, Lord, I'll figure the rest out on the way. That's the difference between those who responded at the first and those who responded after. They didn't negotiate. They said, yes, Lord, we will trust you to be fair with us in the end. The landowner replies to them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. It was up to the landowner on what to give. Those who came afterward decided we're going to trust you to be fair. And in that fairness, the one who came late got the same thing as the one who came early. And what this text helps us understand is perspective. Because I imagine the one who came late was thrilled. I only worked an hour and I still got the same thing as everybody else. Thank you, Lord. 
all others who came after said, we, we didn't work a full day, but we still got blessed in this way. Why? Because the owner is fair and saw what we were doing and decided that what we were doing was not going to equate with how we were going to be blessed. But the landowner decided to bless us beyond what we were worth. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Sometimes God gives you what you don't deserve because God is just good that way. You don't deserve what you get. God sees past the mistakes you make. God sees the potential in who you can be and says, God, I'm going to bless you for what you can become, not for who you are right now, not for what you put in right now, because what you put in right now doesn't guarantee what I'm giving you, but I'm giving to you to let you know I appreciate the small steps that you were willing to make. You simply said yes, and so I'm going to bless you enormously. Why? So the next time I offer you an invitation, you'll respond, what we do in the day, Lord. I will trust you to be fair, and however you're going to distribute this, I'm not going to ask you for a specific blessing. I'm going to trust that if I put forth this effort to be a blessing to others, as you've been a blessing to me, then you're going to do something miraculous and wonderful. The landowner reminds those who agreed to work earlier, they have received exactly what they bartered for, exactly what they negotiated for. They got the daily wage. The generosity of the landowner is what came into play. God lavishes upon us equally regardless of who we are when we've entered relationship with God, which brings us to point number three. Now, here's the hard one. God's actions only seem unfair because we expect God to operate using the same system of favoritism we employ. God's actions only seem unfair because we expect God to use and operate the same system of favoritism that we employ. God does not compare us to one another. Rather, God measures the authenticity and sincerity of our hearts. And I am thankful that God judges the hearts and mind and not my words and actions because all of us can fake looking like we know what we're doing. Have you ever been on a workplace with someone who faked like they knew what they were doing until the report came due and all of a sudden it all came crashing down and what they wanted to do was lay it at your feet? So they said, uh, can you help me with the report? So they could put your name at the bottom of it and said, I don't know what she did. We've all been in that environment where we know someone has no idea what they're doing, but all of a sudden they get promoted to be our supervisor. And the audacity of the people above us said, can you train them to do the job that you're qualified for, but they're not? It only seems unfair because we expect God to use the same system of favoritism that we employ. God often grants us mercy, although our actions indicate that we deserve judgment. The last thing any of us should become is jealous or, jealous or envious of those new in faith getting lavishly blessed by God or having God press and push us to give up our personal preferences as prioritization in order to do something bigger and grander to see others come to relationship with God. A mark of spiritual maturity is when we can celebrate others being blessed knowing that it does not detract from what God will do For us, as faithful disciples of Christ, we ought to be more focused on giving God more of ourselves and less concerned with getting more from God. Friends, God is the only one in relationship that can justifiably ask and say, I deserve more. God deserves more of our time and nurturing our relationship. God deserves more of our talents offered for the benefit of our community of faith. God deserves more of a cheerful, generous spirit so that we might joyfully partner with God to be a blessing to those around us. God deserves more of our relevant and compassionate service. God deserves more from us, for God has certainly given us more than we deserve. And so in those moments... When our six-year-old self starts to come out and we start saying to God, I deserve more. Why do they get a bigger blessing? Why do they have to be? Why do I always have to be the one to say I'm sorry first? That we have a moment of holy remembrance of the grace and love and mercy God has poured on us lavishly. And we say to ourselves, Lord, I'm not asking for more. I'm going to give you more. For indeed, Lord, you deserve more. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 